Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our final webinar of the year. My name is Sean Kimji, and I'm the Vice President at Alterna Wealth, and I'm happily joined here with John Bai, Chief Investment Officer at NEI Investments. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we are uh, in a listen-only mode, and so you will, if you would like to answer, or not answer, but if you would like to ask a question, you can certainly do that in the chat function. This webinar will be recorded and will be posted on our website or on demand for you to capture. Uh, so John, by Chief Investment Officer at NEI Investments, we've had him on a number of times, uh, certainly a wealth of information. Uh, John, if you're okay with it, I'm not gonna read your complete bio out because we've done that a couple of times and we actually had it sent out in the uh, webinar invite. So um, if you did read the invite, you'll see John has got a wealth of experience and we're very pleased to have him on today. So John, you know, I was preparing for this webinar and I was thinking about the year that has passed. Uh, it's hard to believe it's early December. Uh, we've been in a pandemic for, it'll be two years in the spring coming up. And, you know, when I think about what's happened in the markets, we've had markets go down, we've had them go up. We've had the pandemic, we've had new variants, we've had inflation, we've had labor concerns. And I think the timing of this webinar is, 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 is actually well played out because a lot of our members wanna know your thoughts on you know, where the market has been, kind of that year in review. Um, obviously, you know, what your thoughts are going into the new year. And you know, uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of these days is the discussions around responsible investing as well. And I know NEI has played a very strong part, has had a long history in responsible investing. So with that, I'm not gonna take up much more time and I'll turn it over to you, John, to you know provide us your thoughts. Great, thank you very much, Sean. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, let me go out and um, share my screen. So let me see that uh, for a second. Do, 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 do. Where is my share screen? Sorry. Um, you would think that I would be uh, better at this by now, but here we go. Can you see my screen? Okay. I will. Um, I'm hoping that you're seeing my screen and uh, Sean. Yes, we are. Thank you, John. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So, yes, thank you again, Sean, for inviting me to the year end market update. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, the pace of change that we've seen over the past 18 months has been nothing short of absolutely stunning. Um, you've mentioned uh, most of the developments that I could I could mention. Uh, and, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. We're, we're at a point where uh, things are absolutely changing. And uh, I did want to, um, you know, I, and I did uh, want to address some of those changing issues. Uh, for instance, uh, what's happening with inflation, what's happening with the central banks, uh, and and what and what that means for for asset prices going forward. So let's just do a quick 2021 review, if that's okay. Uh, and so, really, with that, what um, I'm going to um, start off with uh, some numbers here, just to give us some context. I'm going to focus on this year to year to date uh, time um, uh, column. And what you're going to see here is that it's been a very risk on environment where uh, the safer assets like Canadian bonds had negative uh, years as they helped had to deal with higher inflation. Global bonds did, a, did better than Canadian bonds, but the riskiest of bonds, those are um, credit bonds, high yield credit bonds, uh, had a very positive return of 3.28%. And then on the, on, the, on the equity side, we've had an incredible uh, year. In fact, actually equities have done, uh, uh, by the most part, uh, better than, uh, than, than in 2020. Uh, the 2020 returns were, were very robust, 20% plus for Canadian U.S. equities, as well as, um, um, uh, you know, uh, but off the North American shores, got a little bit more challenging in Europe and then certainly in the emerging markets. Uh, and then, um, you know, with um, the U.S. dollar uh, was fairly stable, uh, particularly against the Canadian dollars. Uh, but uh, we've seen the Canadian dollar actually having some real strength uh, as a result of the strong energy prices that we saw in 2021. So with that, on the fixed income side, uh, what we will say is that, um, you know, it, it really is. Uh, we had this dramatic increase in, uh, in interest rates on the 10-year Treasury bond rates. 
uh, in the first quarter of 2021. And um, you know, and after that dramatic rise, uh, as as the investors really began to price in a reopening of the economy, peak growth, and peak inflation, uh, and then uh, once we hit 175 on the U.S. 10-year Treasury, what we saw was um, uh, the markets really, the 10-year bond yield really start to trade in a in a in a pretty tight range of, of, of half a percent or 50 basis points, we call it, uh, from 175 to down here uh, about 125 and pretty much spent the rest of um, you know, that, the, the year uh, gyrating uh, between that range. Um, and, but you know, that, that was the 10 year. Um, really, uh, I really highlighted here uh, the two year bond because the two year bond is the one that's most sensitive to, um, to, to short term um, price price changes. Uh, in expectations of the Federal Reserve and short-term interest rates, and you'll see here that you know that that they've they, they've stayed stabilized near zero uh, right after the pandemic and stayed down for a long, long time. Even after we saw that dramatic rise uh, in the ten-year bond yield, um, there was still no expectations that the Fed was going to move that they were going to be very patient uh, because the thinking at the time was that um, those inflationary pressures were very uh, transient or uh, in, in nature. Uh, but then, you know, as as the year progressed, and particularly in the months of uh, late November and early December, you really uh, saw that the markets are starting to price in um, uh, moves uh, in in the um, in the Federal Reserve, and so this gap uh, between the ten-year bond yield and the two-year bond yield is narrowing. And and because of that narrowing, really, what what we see is that whenever this gap widens, that typically means that the economy is booming. Uh, and is expected to continue to boom. And then as this gap between the 10 year and the two year begins to narrow, uh, you know, that, that financial conditions start to tighten and that, that, that anticipates slower economic growth on a go forward basis. On the equity fronts, as I mentioned, uh, we had a great year, both uh, in the US and in Canada. Uh, you know, it, you know it, again, uh, I did mention that S&P did surpass 2020 levels. Uh, what, what was significant for me was the S&P 500 Printed new highs 75 times, uh, all-time highs, and uh, all told, uh, the U.S. benchmark is up over 100% uh, from the March 2020 low. So an incredible, incredible um, rebound. And, and again, you know, that's <laughs> it sounds incredible, 100%. Uh, but when you actually think about the math, it's not as incredible uh, because when you fall 50% it takes a 100% rebound just to get to where you started again. And that's just where the rebound happened. But you know, that's one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve and, and, and the central banks were so aggressive uh, was because they wanted to make sure they supported uh, the economy and, and it was with, with uh, so much support to make sure that there was no permanent loss uh, in jobs as well as permanent loss in the economies. And, and the markets really began to reflect that. The, the other point I would say here is that I, I put a, a here the, the top 50 mega cap um, stocks, and that's really the Russell top 500 mega cap technology index. And you'll see here that as incredible year as the S&P has, that was really primarily driven uh, by, by the mega cap tech stocks. And, uh, and again, it's, it's been um, you know, a very narrow market. Uh, and a lot of the price appreciation that we've seen in the market has been very narrowly confined to um, uh, to, um, to, to, to technology companies. And, and that uh, you know, isn't a really healthy environment. Uh, but uh, you know, in, in 2022, uh, 2021, later half, we began to see that beginning to broaden out uh, to include energy, real estate, and financials. And again, as we start to think about 2022, we think that there's gonna be further broadening uh, in that, uh, in, in that um, uh, performance of, 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 equity, of equities. So uh, we talked about inflation. Uh, inflation's on your mind on probably the number one question I receive. Uh, so I, I put up here a quick uh, Canadian CPI chart uh, versus inflation. Uh, and really, um, uh, you know, this is, um, you know, the first time that we've see, seen, um, you know, since uh, the, the Bank of Canada has put in um, inflation targets of 1% on the bottom, 1% uh, on the bottom end and 3% on the top end. 
And, and you know, what, what's really super interesting about this uh, from my perspective is a couple of things. Number one, the Bank of Canada was one of the first, actually the first uh, central bank in the world to put in these inflationary targets just so that investors will get a sense of what, uh, what, what, what is uh, the recommended range from their perspective. Uh, and then with this recent rise in inflation uh, at 4.7% in October, that matches um, the highest that we've seen um, since they started targeting the inflation since 1991. U.S. Uh, we're seeing uh, inflation there surging even more. Uh, core CP, uh, sorry, uh, headline CPI in the U.S. Uh, topped at 6.2, uh, and uh, th those are the highest levels. And so, you know, really, what, what was interesting, you know, as the year developed was that beginning of the year, you know, the the, the, the central banks, including the Canadian central bank you know, really believe that these inflationary pressures were, were quote, quote unquote, transitory, uh, temporary, um, you know, just driven by that, um, you know, whenever you reopen an economy, there's gonna be friction points. And because there were friction points, uh, you know, things like uh, hotels and used cars and, and, and supply chain issues are really driving up uh, inflation on, on that side. Uh, but, you know, as, but, but this has persisted a lot more and a lot longer uh, than uh, than the central banks had anticipated, and so as a result, they're they're, they're you know they're they're realizing that, that that we need to start to address this in a much more aggressive manner, and that's why you've seen the tone of central banks beginning to change. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more. I think I have a slide a little bit later on to talk about that. Um, Sean, I see that you've jumped on here. Did you want to ask a question, or do you want me to continue? I, I I am I do want to ask a couple of questions, but I will let you uh, get to your your other points there because uh, they're all tied together with interest rates and inflation, and I know we've received questions from our membership around that. So uh, likelihood is you'll probably address most of it, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll wait until the end. Okay, uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, the unemployment rate again. Um, so really, what I what I want to do is is paint 2021 as a, a period of healing where we had that sharp, aggressive um, uh, pain of, of, of a shutdown, a pandemic shutdown economy. And really, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we saw the governments and central bankers take bold actions to ensure that there was no permanent losses in, in, in employment, uh, no permanent job uh, uh, losses in, 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 e in the economic. And, and, and what happened in, in, during the global financial crisis is that we really never did get back to trend. It took, you know, and it was the, the 10 years after the global finances uh, financial crisis, it was really dubbed the jobless recovery. And so this is why um, governments and central banks were so aggressive this time around to make sure that that didn't happen. And, and, and we saw there, there was a payoff here. Uh, again, the U.S., um, this is Canadian, we fully recovered all of our job losses. Uh, the U.S. one looks very similar. Uh, the U.S. has lost about 25 million jobs, and we're just about here on the U.S. side. Again, the highest, un uh, sorry, the lowest unemployment rates in the U.S. since uh, since the pandemic started. Uh, so again, uh, it's really nice to see that they have been healing uh, in, in employment levels. And in fact, right now, the trouble isn't finding jobs for the unemployed. It's the exact opposite, is finding workers for the job openings that we have within the economy. Um, consumer spending uh, has also been above trend. So on here, uh, I put uh, the, the US consumer spending. You'll see that it, uh, you know, with very strong uh, balance sheets and very low interest rates, uh, we're seeing that um, uh, the, 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 the consumer spending uh, um, really recover from the post-pandemic post lows to above trend now. But again, what the, the composition of the spending is, is super important because uh, you'll see on the very far right hand, right hand side, uh, we've, um, we've, we've taken out uh, spending on services, which is the green, lower green line, and spending on goods. And just because of the pandemic and the slowly reopening of the economy and the uncomfortableness of many of the services and getting up and close and personal of, of these services, um, you know, we spent most of our, 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 um, our, our cash on, on, on goods. Um, you know, furniture, TV shopping. Uh, we have someone on my team uh, that went to go and buy a couch and he was told that the couch he wanted, it would take a year for him to, uh, to get. So he's decided to move on to another couch that uh, didn't have such a, such a backup. But, you know, this, this, this incredible demand that we're seeing for goods, um, you know, is really driving a lot of the inflationary pressures. And so this is why uh, the central banks are beginning to realize that they need to take some of the stimulus off the table. They need to take some of that, uh, that demand off the table to really shrink uh, the, the, um, uh, the gap between demand for goods 
and the production of goods. And so really this is uh, addressing the production of goods and you're seeing in China, uh, again, we saw post another post COVID bottom, uh, but you know, really uh, as, as everyone on this call knows, China has, has been dubbed the manufacturing hub of the world. And you see that they've really ramped up industrial production on the post COVID. In fact, actually they're up more than 20% uh, from the from the pre-COVID trend lines, and so you know we've been dubbing this as um, really a problem of supply chain, but you know and, and there are some uh, uh, problems of getting these goods that were made in China into North America. Uh, the lines and uh, the lineup of ships in the in the LA port, for instance, continues. Uh, to, to lengthen, I can't remember now how many days those ships, but they're 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 just waiting in line to get into the port because of shortages. And so there are definitely some of that, uh, but uh, you know, really, uh, it's it's less of a supply gap and more of a demand gap, and that's why the central banks are beginning to uh, to to. Uh, um, to address this a little bit more aggressively, and of course, you know, no, um, uh, you know, the most recent volatility in the markets that we've seen uh, have been, um, you know, in part due to this new Omicron variant uh, that was first identified in Southern Africa. Uh, you know, this is a really interesting case for me, where scientists did the right thing. They saw um, this spike from 200 cases, pretty stable at 200, uh, 200 cases per day. All of a sudden, in one week, they spiked up to 2,000. And the scientists there said, oh, what's going on there? And so uh, they, they looked at all of the tests that were going on on the positive test, taste test, and they realized that this that the genomic uh, profile had changed uh, in the COVIDs that they were testing. And so uh, they quickly uh, picked up the phone, called who, and let everyone know, know that this new variant is out there. It's now very fast spreading. It's in 40 uh, countries, including US and Canada. Uh, still is not much, it's too early. Um, you know, we got um, uh, just basically two weeks ago, notice that uh, of this new variant. So it's still early, we still have to do a lot of studies. But you know, the early, the early signs uh, are, are quite positive. Not the fact that, you know, it's very, um, very viral, it's very transmittable. Um, that's the negative. The positive, though, is, is, is that so far, knock on wood, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the symptoms uh, of those have been a lot milder uh, than the Delta variant. Uh, and so, uh, you know, hospitalizations really um, aren't spiking uh, in, um, in, 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 the, in South Africa and, and other areas. And so, uh, like I said, we're still very early days. It's literally oh, days and weeks since we've just found out about this new variant. But hopefully, um, you know, it, it will be, if, you know, if it does spread a lot uh, and the symptoms are very mild, this actually may, may be um, um, the way the world uh, gets um, herd immunity. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll continue to obviously watch. Uh, and uh, again, it just reiterates that all of our projections uh, come with a heightened sense of uncertainty uh, as, uh, as we will have to, uh, uh, then all subject to the pandemic related developments. So central bank action, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, really uh, since uh, mid-November, uh, the the, uh, the Federal Reserve has been quite aggressive uh, in um, uh, in messaging to the markets that they are going to start to take stimulus uh, and accommodation off the table. Uh, you know what I call um, that that we're in this period of extraordinary policy accommodation. A lot of fancy words, but basically saying that uh, you know if you're a car and you're driving your car, that pedal is all the way to the floor. You cannot push that 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 speed uh, any faster than we're going right now. And so right now, that's causing friction. That's causing um, uh, problems in the economy. And so they need to start taking that 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 uh, that foot off the pedal. It's still accommodative. It's still stimulative but just less than stimulative. And so the first step is, is that one of the reasons that, one of the ways that they've been able to uh, keep interest rates low on the long hand is by purchasing all of these bonds. Uh, they're purchasing um, 120 billion bonds a quarter, uh, sorry, a month uh, in the US. And so uh, they're starting to uh, reduce that by 30 billion a month. And uh, in the December meeting, which is I guess in, in 10 days from now, nine days from now, um, uh, we, we expect them fully to say they're gonna double that pace of, uh, of, of reducing the amount of bond purchases they're going to make. Uh, and so their bond purchase program then would be, uh, or tapering, we call it, uh, will be finished in, uh, in in March. And what that gives them is that gives the central bank a lot more room for um, optionality. And so they can keep it there. And if the Omicron variant is, is continuing to create uncertainty in the economic environment and economic growth really begins to slow down, then they can just pause. 
But if inflation continues to grow and Omicron isn't, isn't really a factor, then they can go on to the next step, which is actually start to hike rates. And so uh, really what you'll see here is that by the end of, of 2022, uh, the markets have fully priced in two rate hikes. Uh, and um, and uh, you know it's not just the Federal Reserve, but here in Canada, we're fully expected. We've already ended our bond purchasing program uh, in November uh, in a surprise move. And we're fully expected to be uh, raising rates in Canada uh, in uh, the first quarter of next year. And, uh, and, and again, we'll probably be one of the first central banks around the world to do that. So what does all that mean for global growth? Well, uh, global growth, again, what you see here is I put the latest IMF uh, forecasts and you'll see that uh, from the peak periods of 2021, that we're going to see um, um, uh, deaccelerating a, a grow of growth rates as this extraordinary stimulus that, that we've seen uh, begins to wear off and we start going to trend. The bright orange number that I have on my screen, that is, um, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, in 2022 and in 2023, uh, slowly get down to trend. I put that trend in that big black uh, thick line, 3.1%. Uh, uh, we're still above trend. And we're still going to be, uh, we still expect to remain above trend for the next uh, two or three years. And that's why we're fairly, um, uh, that, that bodes well for earnings. Uh, and that's why uh, we continue to have a positive outlook on risk assets. Again, uh, lots of uh, headwinds, uh, including that new variant, uh, lots of tailwinds, uh, including uh, good, um, the, the reduction of supply chains. But all in all, that, that's our main message. So inflation. Sean, I know you have lots of questions on inflation. So here's my inflation chart. Um, again, um, inflation continues to be uh, driven by high uh, personal goods consumption and high energy prices. <clears throat> we expect um, you know, that um, excess uh, demand to, to really begin to dissipate. Uh, we, we also anticipate that uh, supply chains um, and the difficulties of getting supplies in, uh, such as semiconductors for cars to begin to dissipate. And so all of that means is that, 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 that we expect inflation pressures to, uh, to, to start to, uh, to move down. What's really good about the inflation that we are experiencing is this, is that because most of the inflation is concentrated in goods um, and also concentrated in energy prices, they're, they're, they're very, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not what we call sticky. They're, they're, they're actually very temporary. So when you start to increase demand, uh, sorry, increase supply or decrease demand, um, goods inflation will go up and down fairly easily and fairly rapidly. And so, um, you know, it's an inflation that, that, that we're not too worried about. Services, on the other hand, are much more sticky because of rising wages. Uh, and and they, 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 they would persist much longer, but we're not really anticipating that right now. And so we'll keep a close eye on it. But for now, uh, we do expect um, that as the supply constraints, as demand starts to switch from goods to services, uh, that um, the, the, this very strong um, upward uh, pressures on prices will begin to dissipate much more to, to trend uh, by the end, not, not right away, not the beginning of 2022, uh, but by the end of 2022 and into 2023. John, yeah, um, you, you know, back when we talked uh, probably six months ago, I think, uh, you know, the, the prevailing theory was that inflation is transitory. Would you still call this transitory or would you call this a sort of just a, a deceleration once the supply issues are, are addressed? Yeah, no, great question. And I'm so glad that you asked it. Um, so, so the answer is it, it is transitory, but it also depends on what your definition of transitory is. And so, if you're, if you know, if you're, um, you know, a, a normal consumer, temporary inflation means next quarter uh, we're going to see that prices go down. Uh, from a central banker perspective, transitory isn't um, next quarter or even two quarters from now. It means that is this a non-permanent thing, and that we expect that to go down perhaps late next year and early the year after. And that for them, because this is all driven. Uh, by um, uh, all, all driven by temporary factors that are expected to dissipate. That's why we, they think it's transitory. It's just, it's just going to take some time to, to cool throughout the system. So um, it's a technical question. Is it transitory? Because it all, like everything else, it depends on your definition. Uh, but because we believe that all of this isn't this wage spiral where we're seeing like what we have in the 1970s, for instance, you know, we saw 
uh, you know, prices go up and wages go up and we just created this, this inflationary cycle. Uh, you know, we're, we're not expecting um, uh, that because like I said, most of the inflation that we're seeing today is on goods. And because it's all goods, uh, we do expect that uh, to dissipate over time. Just to follow up to that, John, and I apologize. Um, no, this is, this, is, this is what I want. We want interaction, the, so I'm glad you're doing this. That's great. So um, when we look at inflation and we look at the demand uh, and the, the goods, if we continue to see the difficulty of goods being brought into market uh, because of port restrictions or, or other um, um, material items that you know limit the production of goods, uh, would we anticipate a, a faster rising rate environment? And consequently, if we do see that the demand does ease um, or supply increases, then would we see possibly rates not go up as quickly um, to counter the inflation issue? Yeah, uh, you know, th these are, um, you know, these are great questions. Um, and, and this is what we're grappling with as investors right now. And so the answer to, to, to all of that, um, one of the key things um, that, that, that your question brings is, you know, at what level of inflation does the, the, the central bank really start to worry about? And what I will tell you that it's not so much a numeric, either, even though the Bank of Canada, as I said, okay, we want it to be between one and 3%. What's really important is not just short-term inflation numbers, but also long-term. What are a consumer saying that I think inflation is going to be over the next three years, five years, 10 years? Uh, and we can get a good sense of that both in surveys as well as uh, in what's priced into the five-year bond or the 10-year bond. Uh, and, 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 and this is why um, the, the, the central bank started to get worried is because longer-term expectations started to creep up. And they started to go to the high end of their range. And so that's why they started to, to talk aggressively saying, OK, guys, um, we're, we're, we're going to become more aggressive here. And, um, and, and so, um, you know, so I, I think that, you know, um, because we think that there's excess demand and the reason why we're buying so many couches and fridges and um, all of those things is because interest rates are so low uh, and housing prices, you know, obviously get, get lifted because of low interest rates. Central bank needs to start to take some of that off, take some of that heat off. Let's just bring it up a little bit. Let's not overkill it because um, uh, we say that monetary policy is a blunt tool. What we mean by that is that when they raise it by a lot, 1%, 2%, 3%, 3%, all of a sudden we go into recession pretty quickly. And so they're, they're, they're pretty cognizant of that. So they're, they're gonna start taking up a little bit. They're gonna see how, how, how the markets react, but also more importantly, how demand reacts. And they'll slowly ratchet that up uh, and, uh, you know, I think they're cognizant of, of, of not really um, um, creating a, another recession. So they'll do that very cautiously. But um, at the same time, if they see inflation expectations at the long end start to go up and then we start to break these into wage increases and that becomes into that potential inflationary cycle, they're going to have to be much more aggressive. And that's the delicate line that they're walking. And this is why, you know, Jeremy Powell probably got his wish and he was reelected as chairman of the Federal Reserve for a second term. But he has a very delicate line that he has to walk right now. And that is to keep um, the economic path um, uh, positive, but at the same time, uh, dampening inflation expectations. Thanks. Does that answer your question? It does. Great. Please continue. Sorry. Okay. Excellent. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this all brings us to what does this mean for the markets? And so really um, we're, we're entering in 2022, a different market phase. Uh, in the first phase, as I said, I was very liquidity driven. Uh, central banks went to zero, great monetary and policy uh, and, and fiscal stimulus. Uh, and then you see, I, you have two lines here. One line is earnings for sure in that, that blue line. And then the green line, uh, these are bars. Uh, these are the uh, PE ratios. And what you'll see is that in March, 2020, uh, PE ratios are very, very low. But as investors, because the markets are always forward looking, uh, as, as, as investors started to price in a recovery and anticipate a recovery, multiples expanded from about 20 times the PE ratio to uh, almost 30 times. Uh, and, and, that, um, you know, and that's where you saw those big uh, movements. Uh, the earnings still haven't fully recovered yet, but the markets were getting to price it in. But look what happened this year. 
Um, the PE multiples actually didn't grow. Um, they actually shrank. Valuations became much more reasonable uh, as, as the earnings began to deliver. And we've had some really good, uh, uh, the second quarter and the third quarter earnings have been terrific. Uh, and as a result, we've seen our PE multiples uh, begin to flatten. And, and, and so this is where we are today. And so then now most of our, our, our gains that we're gonna see in the equity markets now aren't gonna be liquidity and PE multiple expansion uh, driven. They're gonna be more fundamentally driven. And this is why we're paying so much attention to the earnings uh, season and, uh, and earnings of companies because companies that have good earnings are being rewarded and their stocks are going up and companies that are having bad earnings, they're being punished and their stocks are going down. So this is a much, uh, this is a much more um, uh, healthier environment uh, where that rising tide of strong liquidity lifting all boats um, is gone. And we're now going to focus on companies that actually have good quality, decent balance sheets, good earning go uh, growth rates, decent valuations. They're the ones that are going to do better in this, this environment. So, you know, we're, in this second phase, we are now anticipating now that instead of just the, the mega cap stocks um, driving returns, we're going to see that broadening out uh, uh, into other sectors. And that's why, you know, this is what we call an active a manager's uh, market where, uh, again, it's very hard for, uh, you know, when five companies are over 20, about 25% of the index to be overweight, these mega cap companies like Apple, Google, Facebook. Um, uh, but now if returns start to go to other companies, then uh, active fund managers actually have a better chance of outperforming the benchmark. And, and that's the kind of environment we now think we're in. Um, yeah, uh, so again, risk uh, main in favor. So I just talked about that. And that's our disclaimer. Um, Sean, I'm going to apologize. I have a whole RI section that didn't make it into this presentation. So I'm going to address the RI just by talking and not having slides. I hope you're okay with it. But, you know, I, I do want to, um, is there a question that you want me to address? Maybe I'll address your question, or I can just go into my spiel that I wanted to talk about. Um, maybe I'll just ask uh, one or two questions, John. So, you know, I, I, I glanced over at my phone and I was looking and checking the markets, um, you know, see where they ended up today. And, you know, we certainly had a, an interesting positive day on the markets. Um, you know, and you hear the media sometimes that, you know, are we going to have a Santa Claus rally? Would you call this a Santa Claus rally based on the earnings we're seeing? Yeah, well, you know what? Like, you know, I, I haven't seen a Santa Claus rally. I've seen a Santa Claus volatility. Uh, and, and, uh, and so, um, you know, this is Santa Claus hitting the roof and kind of bouncing off the roof. It wasn't a clean landing for sure. Uh, but, you know, as, as, you know, as we go and get into, um, as, as people make, um, so really what's happening at the beginning of the month, typically, Sean, is that people are locking in positions. Company, you know, when you have good rates of return, they're selling your winners. They're locking in and they're creating some, some selling and they're just going to do nothing. And, and so that, that's why you see that, that, that volatility at the beginning of the month. And so when all of that finishes and then all that selling dissipates, that's when you get the Santa Claus rally, that uh, people, that the net sellers are now out and then the natural buyers start to go in and we get that Santa Claus rally. So I, I suspect that as we get closer to uh, year end, uh, later in the month that we will see a upward, um, a upward bias to markets. But, you know, again, that's just what we typically see. Um, uh, again, there's a little bit more worry with this one uh, with, you know, as we, as we get into to figure out what's happening with Omicron uh, and, and central banks and, and, and. Oh, John, did we lose you for a second there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Oh, sorry. I thought we, we lost you for a second. I don't know if it was my connection or yours, but. We've got you back now. Oh, okay, so uh, I guess my point being, so just to sum up on all of that, is that um, you know now that we have most of the selling happening at the beginning of the month, uh, typically we do see that Santa, Santa, Santa Claus rally happen at the end of the month. But uh, with the uncertainty of the Omicron, uh, we may see um, uh, additional volatility in, in, in the days and weeks ahead. We, we, we've seen, you know, again, I mentioned this earlier on, a lot of discussion now about responsible investing. Um, it, we're hearing it more and more. We hear it from our members, the, the importance of, you know, really doing, um, really being thoughtful in investing, um, you know, not just to generate a return, but to have a positive impact. So perhaps you can talk just a little bit about, and I know you said you didn't have your slides, but that's, and that's okay. I know you, you've been doing this for so long, just a little bit about the, the history 
of NEI and the process you bring to the table and the due diligence you bring, you know, when you're selecting investments for inclusion in your portfolios. Yeah, thank you, you know, um, Sean, for mentioning that. This is a, an important topic for us at NEI. Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of recent attention brought to responsible investing and, and everyone's now talking about it. Every fund manager is now talking about it. Uh, every asset manager is talking about it. But, you know, this is something that uh, isn't new for us. We, we've been um, doing this for 30 years. We've launched Canada's first RI fund back in the 1980s. And, um, you know, I say that we've been wandering in the desert for about 30 years, and now all of a sudden we've hit the promised land and everybody is interested in what we're doing. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, that's, um, so, so we have a long and proud history. And, and really, um, and because of that 30 year history, uh, we've learned a thing or two um, about responsible investing. And so, you know, really when, when we are going and choosing managers uh, um, uh, for, to, to manage our funds, um, we're asking them not only to have really strong um, uh, risk and return um, analysis and fundamental analysis and, and rigor, but we also want them to have the additional capacity to really understand um, ESG risks is what we call them, environmental, social, and governance risks, uh, because you know, uh, we, we strongly believe that these factors will, will improve the risk and return uh, characteristics of our funds. For instance, um, what I will say, you know, a lot of us, when we, when we talk about climate change, we're so used to talking and COP26 is, is, is a good example of this, you know, the biggest UN climate conference that just happened in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, you know, we talk about 2050, uh, 2050, and that's a long time from now. We're going, well, what can we actually do about that? But the reality is that climate impact is, ha is happening now in Canada. Like I just think about our, our poor um, you know, uh, friends out in, in BC, where again, at, earlier in the year, uh, they had this, you know, and we're learning all of these, the, the, these new climate uh, terms like heat domes. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, the record that they had record temperatures, um, costly forest fires, and the deadliest natural disaster in Canadian history. I mean, obviously COVID has taken away all of that talk, but it, it was actually the deadliest. The hundreds of people died in BC uh, because of those, uh, the, those record temperatures. Uh, and, and then now uh, fast forward to November, these, um, you know, this atmospheric river dumping you know, record rainfall, uh, massive flooding, and, and what is now expected to be the most expensive natural disaster in Canadian history. Uh, $32 billion um, um, to repair all of that. And so, you know, all of this is, is, is now impacting our businesses. And because we're asking our, our managers to say, okay, are you incorporating these climate risks into your analysis um, so that we can start to reduce the volatility of their earnings? And, um, you know, again, um, um, you know, this is, this is really important to us. And so, you know, one of the things that, that, that you know, a retire, um, that, um, so that, that's basically what we do. And, and we spend a lot of time um, 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 interviewing our managers, um, a lot of time, um, uh, again, uh, in our due diligence, but not just in the initial choosing, but on an ongoing basis. And, um, and, and we're seeing, you know, that, that during times of volatility, um, it's really helping our funds. Uh, in March 2020, where you saw uh, that dramatic pullback in the markets, um, RI funds generally outperformed, uh, according to Morningstar, uh, their non-RI counterparts. And here at NEI, uh, over 70% of our equity funds and over 70% of our, um, uh, our, our uh, balanced portfolios uh, our I balance portfolios outperform the benchmark. And so right when you see these dramatic pullbacks in the markets, we're seeing that. Uh, the last week, uh, it just came off a portfolio manager. We, we, we track performance every week and, and we have a group meeting to, to discuss it. Um, all green, right? All green, we've outperformed because you know, this is the time when we expect um, you know, our views uh, and our much more rigor, not just on financial risks, but also uh, all risks uh, come in and help out. So. Um, you know, that's, that, that's what we're seeing. No, and I appreciate that, John, and those comments. And, and, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to our colleagues on the West Coast uh, who have, you know, been embattled, uh, you know, in the summer with the heat dome and with the, the rainfall and the flooding now, it's, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate. Um, and we certainly hope and pray for the best um, uh, that, and a recovery through that area. Um, and, you know, 
couple of, of thoughts that I, I wanted to you know bring to light here. We know that our eye is certainly responsible, responsible investing, but it is um, you know more productive, would you say, in an active market um, because you are investing responsibly. Would you say that responsible investing is is um, um, generating better returns than non RI investments? Yeah, you know, I would say it's cyclical, right? It's like every investment that, um, you know, sometimes they outperform, sometimes they underperform. I'm not going to say blanket wise that responsible investing will always be better than non-responsible investing. Um, you know, that, 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 um, that, that's hard to make a, a blanket. But what I will say is that, um, that, that responsible investing has been a hot topic of uh, academics. Um, there's literally been thousands of academic studies on the subject. And every, uh, um, and every um, like summary of these uh, have, 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 have produced research um, that, um, that, that uh, RI has produced um, companies um, that, uh, that, that have uh, better um, lower cost of capital um, better operational efficiency as a result of that better um, better um, share price and better risk. Uh, and so, you know, there, there, there will obviously be periods just like if you're a growth investor or a value investor, um, there will be periods in which um, the other style will, will, will do better. Uh, but, but over time, you know, we think that companies that are focused on generating sustainable value for all shareholders, not just um, the, the shareholders, but, uh, stakeholders, but not just for the shareholders, but for their communities uh, that they work in, their employees, um, uh, then that, that will generate, uh, and, and, and the environment that will gen generate sustainable uh, value. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, number one is that, you know, right now we have a labor shortage and companies who have a history of treating their employees well are not having they don't have a labor shortage. They're able to attract labor and, and have very productive labor as a result of that. Um, and, and, um, and, and again, that, that's proving net beneficial. Um, you know, if you have a reputation of, of being a company uh, that, um, that, that is very combative with your employees, I'll, I'll bring up a recent controversy. Activision, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of that stock in the US, it's a gaming stock and very notorious uh, for um, a male dominated culture. And that culture has really permeated into um, uh, the employee culture as well. And there's been Wall Street Journal articles on this and to the point where um, their employees are going on strike because they believe that management is not taking um, uh, enough action. Well, here's my point. If you have this combative relationship with your employees, are you going to attract the best employees to, to code and to develop the best games on a go forward basis? Or are you, um, are you going to have troubles? And, uh, and, and so, you know, and we, we firmly believe that companies that, um, that, 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 that don't have this combative uh, relationship, but actually uh, create this healthy environment where their employees can come and feel safe and just really do well uh, and code and, and be productive, that is those companies that will generate sustainable value. And that's why, you know, there'll be quarters and months in which um, RI will underperform, but we believe over the long haul of five, 10 years, uh, and most of us are investing for our retirement. So uh, we have longer term time horizons. We think that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, that's a fantastic story. And, and you know, very well laid out for someone uh, to understand of, you know, how you actually apply those principles when you're looking at evaluating various organizations. So really appreciate that. That uh, Yeah, let me uh, just finish that story. We, we actually, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> were investors in that, in that Activision when all of this came out. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it was so we, 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 we ended up selling um, our, our, like at the very first um, hint of this, and, and you saw the, st the stock sell, uh, sell off. But, but we did have a small piece, and that, that, that small piece um, did allow us to write uh, letters to the CEO. Uh, and, you know, we, we joined a coalition demanding um, change, management change of this company, and actually board changes as well. And so, you know, again, you know, this is the type of company that, 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 we're, that, that we're not afraid to have these very difficult conversations. And when we think change is the appropriate thing, uh, we will actually go against management. And, uh, and again, uh, you'll see us in, in a few, like Washington um, uh, Post, for instance, wrote an article uh, where we were named. And again, you know, this is just, you know, we believe so strongly in this 
that uh, you know we're willing to, to 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 talk and pick up the phone and write letters to 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 ensure that this change happens. No, and I think that's a really important point, John, where you're not just um, divesting yourself of an investment because you there was a problem with the organization, but you're trying to affect change. And so, you know, while still maintaining a position, you are, uh, now have the ability to, to work with management and to try and uh, engage with them to, to make change. So it, 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 I think it's a really admirable piece of, you know, the, the social governance part of what we do at, at NEI. Um, I just wanted to let the audience know that if you do have questions, you can submit them through the chat function. Uh, I've got just two other questions, John, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Um, so the, the first one would be, you know, we, we talked about, or you, you mentioned the growth uh, recently in the last two years and how we've had very strong growth in the markets. Should investors, you know, looking forward to 2022 uh, with some of the headwinds you mentioned, start to temper their expectations of returns, um, you know, considering what they've seen over the last 24 months? Yeah. Uh, do I think that we're going to see another 18 months of 100% rates of return on the stock market? Not likely. Um, but so, so, but but do I think so? If, if I think about earnings, and I say this is going to be a very earnings driven market. Uh, right now, we're expecting uh, the consensus view for earnings on the S&P 500 is 9% earnings in 2022. And that's, you know, um, that's fairly in line with, with long-term averages. And, and I think that's quite reasonable. So I think that, you know, we're, we're probably going to go back to uh, just like the economic growth is going to go from these very high levels down to trend. Um, the economic, uh, the, 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 the market returns on equities started out really high. We're going to go back down to trend. And so uh, that, that trend on the equity side will be uh, likely in the high uh, single digits. And, you know, I think that's a healthy rates of return that uh, that's a much more sustainable and what we can expect on a go forward basis. You know, I, I'm a believer that, you know, we, we still have, uh, you know, this above average growth and, um, and, and that will benefit equities. Excellent. We're, we're almost out of time, John. So I wanted to just uh, leave you with one other last question. Uh, if there was one piece of advice, and this might be a little loaded, but if there's one piece of advice you could um, share with our members, uh, what would it be going into next year? So I, I think that um, going into that next year, it's really, really important to maintain discipline. Um, there, 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 there is going to be there are going to be some scary headlines, uh, whether it be the Omicron, whether it be the the, the Fed uh, raising rates. Uh, there's going to be a recession. The inflation's out of control. You know, there's so many things for us to worry about. Um, but you know what what, what we've seen uh, in the last few weeks is that you know well balanced portfolio has done exactly what it's supposed to do. The equity sold off, the bonds went up, and uh, and that's really helped mitigate um, uh, concerns. Um, there's going to be lots of reasons for us not to contribute to our RSP uh, this this coming January and February, uh, but that would be a mistake. We just need to continue uh, that uh, you know that 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 that. Keep our discipline, uh, invest even when it's scary, uh, and uh, and just focus on our long-term goals that, you know, over 5, 10, 20 years, uh, that the markets will do what they'll do. Uh, and, um, and again, for us, uh, you know, if we can go and allocate it uh, and have these very difficult dis discussions to help corporations become better citizens, uh, and improve their, their, their business model uh, and ensure that uh, we're rapidly de de decarbonizing our, our economy to, to, to hit the objectives of, of, of the Paris objectives. Um, you know, I think it's a win-win situation. So if there's one piece of advice, Sean, that would be it. Uh, you know, we're gonna see some scary news, uh, but, uh, but, but talk to your advisor, stay disciplined uh, and focus on the long-term. Oh, I appreciate that, John. And you know, for our members, if you do have questions, uh, we are available to help you. You can reach out to us uh, via the branches or you can send an email to wealth at alterna.ca. We're more than happy to have a discussion with you um, and certainly provide any guidance that you're looking to receive. John, I wanted to thank you uh, for your support this year. Uh, we've had a number of webinars with you and with, you know, we've received a lot of uh, favorable comments, appreciation from our members. Certainly thank you for your, your time and your your. Uh, your views on the market and uh, your insights, uh, because you know uh, we do see a lot of comments coming back, um, and certainly appreciate it. Uh, with that, I'd like to you know wish everyone a happy holidays, stay safe, everyone, and look forward to our next series of webinars beginning next year. This concludes our webinar. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone.